Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. Uh, I deeply regret it. The defense minister apologizes again for overstating his role in the Afghan war. He is no longer trustworthy. The president versus the press. It's a tough job, but I've had things that were tougher. Donald Trump defends his record after a roasting like no other. And a Sunday talk on Trudeau and Trump. The New York Times has called Trudeau the new leader of the free world. Does he live up to any of the hype? Plus, <laughs> storyteller, troublemaker, groundbreaker. Nobody had ever drawn a, even a, a critical cartoon of the Queen. Really, ever? Living ever. Our feature interview with a political cartoonist known as Aislinn. Defense Minister Harjit Sajjan has expressed regret and apologized. But after exaggerating his role in an Afghan offensive, he's facing questions about his credibility and integrity. Sajjan's expected to take fire tomorrow in the House of Commons. And as Alison Crawford explains, today that meant more of what military types might call staging a withdrawal. Defense Minister Harjit Sajjan says he's sorry for saying he was the architect of Operation Medusa in 2006, Canada's biggest battle in Afghanistan. I, I deeply regret it. Uh, I made a mistake in uh, describing my role. Uh, for this, I truly uh, I apologize. Um, I want to retract uh, that, that uh, what I had said, because um, I don't want to diminish anything from the sacrifice of our, of our, uh, of our soldiers. Sajjan is apologizing for this story, told earlier this month at a conference in India. And it became the uh, architect of an operation called Operation Medusa, where we removed over 50, about 1,500 fighters, uh, Taliban fighters, off the battlefield. Sajjan's critics pounced, saying he was just one among many people who contributed to Medusa's success. The damage is done. His reputation is tarnage, tarnished under their own, their own ethos within the Canadian Armed Forces and the Department of National Defence. His integrity has been compromised, uh, and it's all self-inflicted. Now, Sajjan did make valuable contributions to Operation Medusa, and he was decorated for his service in Afghanistan. Today, a spokesperson for the Prime Minister said Justin Trudeau continues to have full confidence in Sajjan, but with Parliament resuming tomorrow after a two-week break, it's expected the opposition will try to use question period to raise more doubts about Canada's Minister of Defence. Alison Crawford, CBC News, Ottawa. A U.S. president's 100-day mark is a traditional milestone that can become a millstone. But Donald Trump is nothing if not a serial self-promoter, battling critics backed with bravado. And over the past 24 hours, he's taken on foes both foreign and domestic. Paul Hunter has more. It's something that I really love, and I think I've done a very good job at it. That said, as Donald Trump's been telling reporter after reporter this weekend, being president's actually kind of hard. It's a tough job, but I've had a lot of tough jobs. I've had things that were tougher. That interview, taped to coincide with the symbolic 100-day marker, as it turns out, also coincided with the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner, a glitzy affair where journalists and the president typically poke fun at each other. But with reporters and Trump generally at odds these days, Trump took a pass. The last president to do that? Ronald Reagan. His reason, a few weeks beforehand, he'd been shot. Last night, without Trump there, he was targeted regardless. We gotta address the elephant that's not in the room. <laughs> the leader of our country is not here. And that's because he lives in Moscow. It is a very long flight. It'd be hard for Vlad to make it. Vlad can't just make it on a Saturday. It's a Saturday. As for the other guy, I think he's in Pennsylvania because he can't take a joke. Meanwhile, in Pennsylvania. And I could not possibly be more thrilled than to be more than 100 miles away from Washington Swamp. At a campaign-style rally, Trump talked up his time in the White House so far while, once again, taking on at least some in the news media. Very dishonest people, and not all of them. You know, we call it the fake news. Not all of them. And though Trump bashed the media often last night, a more pressing issue is quickly taking center stage, North Korea and its nuclear ambitions. 
As U.S. warships arrive in nearby waters, this weekend Trump spoke on the issue with Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte, as well the leaders of Singapore and Thailand and earlier Japan and China. If a long rumored nuclear test by North Korea goes forward... I would not be happy. If he does a nuclear test, I will not be happy. Not happy mean military action? I don't know. I mean, we'll see. Says the White House speaking with those leaders is to ensure everyone's on the same page on North Korea. As Trump now embarks on his second hundred days, it's clear the job isn't about to get any easier. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Americans across the South and Midwest are reeling from this weekend's severe weather, including deadly tornadoes. At least 11 people were killed across multiple states, four in East Texas, where several twisters touched down. Dozens of people were hospitalized. There are also road closures and evacuations in Missouri and Arkansas because of extreme flooding. Justin Trudeau was among tens of thousands of people attending Sikh New Year celebrations in Toronto today. Happy Vesaki. We'll see you all soon. Happy Kalsa Day. Earlier, the city's 39th Kalsa Day parade wound its way through downtown streets. The event marks one of the most important dates in the Sikh calendar. Nova Scotians found out today they'll be voting in one month. As a formality, the Premier visited the Lieutenant Governor to ask permission. He said yes. Stephen McNeil called the election just days after his Liberal government introduced a balanced budget. Anger is intensifying for residents of a 12-story condo in Winnipeg. They've been without a working elevator for nearly two weeks. Those who can have been taking the stairs, but people with mobility issues feel trapped, and fire officials say the situation is a safety hazard. Jill Kuber has the latest. Slow and steady, Diana Nowicki makes her way down four stories of stairs. She's 83. The ones we just came down, those are really steep, so you could fall and hurt yourself badly. Her condo building has been without both elevators for almost two weeks. They broke down because of an electrical issue. This is kind of the, the last straw, I think, for a lot of people living here. Joanna Weeb lives on the top floor, 12 stories high. It's so frustrating, like I have to suppress how angry I am because probably there's a notice under my door every few days and each time it explains how it was probably going to be checked into in the next few days. Residents have been told three separate times elevators would be fixed by now. The latest notice from property manager Towers Realty says there's a software problem with the motors. It's unforgivable. Head of the Firefighters Union, Alex Forrest, says this violates fire codes and inspectors have given warning. There's people that are literally trapped in that building, vulnerable individuals. This man with muscular dystrophy has moved out until it's fixed. He plans to file a human rights complaint. And down in the lobby... You guys moving out too? Yeah, I've been out for 10 days and it's not That's my last day too. For Richard Duncan, no elevator was the final straw. He says he already spent two months this winter without heat. I'll be thankful to hand in the keys. CBC News tried unsuccessfully to reach the property management for comment. In its latest notice to residents, it says the elevators will be back up tomorrow, but people living here say they'll believe it when they see it. Jill Kubra, CBC News, Winnipeg. U.S. President Donald Trump will meet with Turkish leader Recep Tayyip Erdogan in a couple of weeks. Security and fighting ISIS are expected to top the agenda. Both men hope to improve relations. But as Erdogan flexes his new executive powers, some key allies, like the United States, are concerned. Neil Cooksall reports. It sounds like victory. But it could easily trigger more violence. U.S. tanks are now protecting this stretch of Syria's border with Turkey and the Kurdish paramilitary fighters, the YPG, helping in the battle against ISIS. The Americans are trying to send a message, not to an enemy, but to a close NATO ally, Turkey itself, which hit the region and those fighters with airstrikes this week. Ankara believes the U.S. is merely using terrorists to fight terrorists. Obama. This is an ongoing process that started during Mr. Obama's administration. It needs to end now, President Erdogan said. 
fighting terror is an obsession here, and there are real threats. But is this one of them? The Turkish government has now blocked Wikipedia. Certain entries were deemed to be a risk to national security. You can change an article, but they prefer to block the website completely, he says. This was done with YouTube and Twitter before. They'll see this is the wrong approach. Also blocked, in fact pulled from the air entirely, some of Turkey's matchmaking shows. Popular, but problematic. A threat, some viewers complained, to the country's culture. And there's more to suggest an ever-tightening government grip. This weekend, nearly 4,000 people, soldiers, academics, civil servants, were suspended from their jobs for alleged ties to the group Turkey believes was behind that deadly attempt to overthrow the government last July. And that's on top of the 10,000 people suspended or detained earlier this week. Need Cooks, all CBC News, Istanbul. A well-known and experienced mountain climber has fallen to his death in Nepal. Swiss climber Uli Steck was preparing to tackle Mount Everest. He died today while doing a practice climb on a smaller peak in the region. Steck was a star of his sport and had won several climbing awards over the years. Whether it's a knockoff handbag or imitation designer sneakers, the business of counterfeit goods is a half a trillion dollar a year industry. Big brands have fought back. But now Louis Vuitton is taking legal action against a flea market in what's believed to be the first case of its kind in Canada. Devin Haru explains. Louis Vuitton, a symbol of luxury with prices to match. Now the company is taking a new tack to fight all those cheap knockoffs. It's going after the landlord of a Toronto flea market. So what they're saying is that if the landlord knows that the tenants who they're renting the space out to is selling counterfeit products, then they have a responsibility as well. This flea market is named in the lawsuit, but the landlord's lawyer says it's impossible to know what's in every stall. It isn't, uh, hello, this is a Louis Vuitton a bag, you know, please buy it at a, at a giant discount. At least I haven't seen that. We have almost everything. The owner of this nearby flea market agrees it's difficult to know who's selling what, but he says two vendors were recently kicked out for selling fakes. You know, we try our best to tell them, you know, leave. If you selling this, we're going to let you go. They leave, and then the new face comes, and then we have to do it again. Louis Vuitton's lawyers aren't talking, but this fashion lawyer is interested in the outcome. This is new to Canada, and definitely it's very interesting, but it's not necessarily new globally, and I think Canada has trailed behind a little bit. In fact, Louis Vuitton took legal action in New York 10 years ago and won. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. Don't go away. The Sunday Talk is next on the anti-Trump. But does Justin Trudeau really deserve all the hype? Stand up, you know I'm opposed here. News reporting is never a nine-to-five job. Newsmen are at work around the clock in a variety of locations. Reading reflector fit. You hear a bit? That's good. Now let me take a reading on your face. I need it. Four, that's four and a half, fine. It's two yeah. to one ratio. Face down. Face down and face up, eh? Yeah. So you want, you want it uh, about 15, 20 seconds on you? And then, and then you want me to pass onto the harbor? Zoom onto a tight shot of those boats in the harbor. Oh, of those boats there and in the harbor? And we can mix to a B-reel at that point, you see. Right, Andy, right. Okay. okay. Now, will you do a, a voice test, please, Andy? It looks like another record year for the Port of Montreal. Fine. Elevated. Okay. Okay. Fine. And you try to keep the reflector here, uh, Fred. Look up a moment, Andy. Yep. There, it's good. Now, I, I like you, I tell you when to roll. Right, when to start, right. Okay? Give me a cue. Yeah. I'll <clears throat> but it's not just a matter of standing in front of a film camera. A reporter has to research his story first, and it may take several hours to garner the facts for a report which will occupy less than 90 seconds of airtime. It looks like another record year for the Port of Montreal. Elevators are still moving last year's bumper wheat crop, 
and Expo provided heavy business in the first months he of 1907. He must think of ways to illustrate his story, as in this case, through the use of silent film being shot simultaneously by another cameraman elsewhere in the harbor area. On the air, the two films will be married, so that the silent film illustrates what the reporter is talking about. I came to Chicago after being involved. And these days, the job of TV reporter isn't solely a man's domain. This girl was one of the first women TV reporters in Canada. She came to television via newspaper work and quickly found a niche doing interviews from a woman's angle. News can be a rough business, however, and a girl reporter must be equally adept at covering everything from a fashion show to a prison riot. It's in an interview such as this, however, that she can probably draw more information from her subject than a wide-eyed male what counterpart you ever would. Uh, before you decide to become a bunny? Well, oddly enough, I was a school teacher. I taught in a high school just outside of Boston in a little, little tiny town, taught speech, drama, and English. What do you think of the club's philosophy of look but don't touch? Well, uh, it's, it's one thing I, I must admit that we've gotten a lot of criticism on, but I think it's mainly because of a misunderstanding. When the bunny, uh, bunny idea, ha or rather the idea of having bunnies was conceived, it was to be comparable to what uh, they have in Japan, the, the highest of the geisha girls, where they uh, provide conversation, they pour the little, they have the ceremony of pouring their tea. Time now for the Sunday Talk, where we tap into the debate of the week. Tonight, 100 Days of Trump for Justin Trudeau. The world has seen the two men as polar opposites. We'll look at the impact Trump's first few months have had on our feminist-hugging, environment-loving, NAFTA-protecting PM. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab him by the Trump came into office with a woman problem. I am a feminist. Trudeau, meanwhile, positioned himself as the feminist in chief. Any initiative we put forward actually uh, gets looked at as, well, is this positive or negative for women? Trump attacked environmental regulations. I am taking historic steps to lift the restrictions on American energy. Trudeau has presented himself as a protector. Pricing carbon is part of uh, the solution that, plus obvious differences on immigration, have fed into the foreign media's embrace of Trudeau as the anti-Trump. You're often cited as the kind of anti-Trump now because you, you believe in this old liberal order. How does it feel to be cast as the world's new big su liberal superhero? And this week, he was heralded for saving free trade. I got a very nice call from Justin Trudeau. Trudeau was portrayed as a sort of Trump whisperer, talking him down from the anti-trade ledge. I highlighted that, uh, quite frankly, a disruption like uh, cancelling NAFTA would cause a lot of short and medium-term pain uh, for an awful lot of families. Trudeau has cozied up to Trump's team, including the daughter-in-chief. But back home, his critics want more substance, less style. The Prime Minister should stop using his cell phone for selfies. Some leading environmentalists call him a poser and a hypocrite. Unlike Trump, Trudeau is still riding high in the polls, but is he as fab as all the hype suggests? I'm joined by our panelists. Tasha Carradine is a talk show host in Toronto. Jonathan Kay is editor-in-chief at Walrus Magazine, who helped Trudeau write his memoir. And Stephen Marsh is an author and writes for Esquire and the New York Times. So, Tasha, I know exactly where you stand on this. You think <laughs> that he lives up to all the hype, that there should be more congratulations. More selfies, please. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I don't think he lives up to the hype. I think it's easy to position him, though, as an anti-Trump because he does hold polar opposite positions to Mr. Trump. But is he uh, the leader of the free world? No. Canada on the world stage uh, is not a major player. And uh, to credit him with being a, tr a Trump whisperer, I find interesting on NAFTA. We know that uh, Trudeau sought the counsel of someone um, who I wouldn't say is ideologically closer to Mr. Trump, but certainly personally closer. That's Brian Mulroney. And I suspect a lot of whispering went on there in terms of, if not what to say, uh, who to say it to, to get these results. So I think that uh, the world is looking for an anti-Trump. Justin Trudeau is probably the easiest thing to paint as such. But uh, I think he's also painted us into a corner 
financially and fiscally, and Mr. Trump's policies are going to cause him a lot of problems in that regard. So we can go into the details in just a moment, but overall, John, I mean, what do you think? Is he the leader, the, the new leader of the free world? Does he live up to that? I think, actually, after Obama went, went out of the White House, uh, there's only a, a small group of Western leaders who stand up for free trade and traditional liberal values. Angela Merkel is one of them. I think Justin Trudeau is obviously another. After that, it's a really short list. So I actually don't think it's a stretch to say that Justin Trudeau is at least helping to uphold free Western liberal values. Stephen? Well, I mean, I agree. I think, you know, we're never going to be a powerful country. Like, we're never going to be the leader of anybody. Mm -hmm. We're Canada. We're in the slipstream of history. But, you know, what our leadership has always been by example, and I think he's provided a great example of what competent, rational, liberal government looks like. Um, and I, I think the idea that it's all just talk is, is kind of nonsense. I mean, we lead the G7 in growth, uh, and we have competent, effective policies that you can see the results of, and th and that's what we show the world. And yeah, I, I gotta, think it's I think it's really I think it really is our moment to make that statement. I got to push back a little. It's, it's, <laughs> okay, Please that do. was a little much. No, I'm curious. Why. Even for me, uh, I think it's, it is true that uh, Justin Trudeau has all the right instincts on on a lot of issues such as trade. Um, however, I think that as is the case with every politician, there's always going to be a gulf between what they promise, what they claim to represent, and the reality. And by the way, on the other side of the coin, we're also seeing this with Trump. Trump came in, he was going to be the Darth Vader figure who flipped off China and flipped off Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then once in Instead office... Of Canada. He's flipped around. <laughs> and, he's flipped around on China. Once, right. Well, you know, basically the thing about Trump is whoever talked to him 15 minutes mm -hmm. ago, that's who convinced him, and now he's decided China's his BFF. <laughs> and so I think... Even on the other side of the political spectrum, Trump himself has probably disappointed a lot of his, his followers. And in the case of Trudeau, you know, no politician ever lives up to, to the hype. Yeah, and I, I was going to say, I don't think, I mean, yes, Canada is economically, uh, we are doing relatively well. But I think that's also in part because he inherited an economy that was doing yes, relatively well. And the enough. United States also is doing relatively well, which people were very worried about how things would go under Donald Trump. But in fact, so far, so good. But um, I was going to say, I think the, the, real ish, the real test for Trudeau is coming because Donald Trump is going to be lowering taxes in the United States, making us far less competitive in terms of industry there. And what I don't like about what Mr. Trudeau's done is he has eliminated the possibility of Canada having any kind of margin to maneuver lower tax rates here because we have such big deficits to deal with. Look, playing, playing the game with Trump is not a game that anyone can win, right? I mean, it's like playing, it's like having a, a two-year-old baby next door with a shotgun. Like, you're just trying to not get killed But it's not today. a game. NAFTA like, is not a know, game. I mean, and there are nine million jobs in the U.S. that depend on it. Millions oh, that I agree in Canada, with you. I, I not wish, a game at all. I, I think it, I, I'm saying it, it's not a game. It, it, I'm just saying it's not a game you can win. Like, you, you have a person there that is totally unpredictable. No one can come up with an effective strategy. I mean, no one, he, he's so unpredictable that there's no way that you can either blame or congratulate people and for their well, effective Well, we saw Donald Trump it. today again saying, you know, I was going to cancel it today. I would have canceled it. But my friend, Justin Trudeau, called me up. He said, let's negotiate. So is that brilliant or is he being played because Trump is threatening him? I think to a certain extent we overanalyze this a little bit because <laughs> when you're dealing with somebody who has ADHD... Yeah. And you throw a ball, and they go chasing after the ball. Are we diagnosing Trump now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think that it's very difficult to ascribe any systematic mm -hmm. uh, influence on Trump from, from China, from Mexico, from Canada, because he's so unpredictable. So smiling and charming him is Well, I think you can the say they haven't made a mistake. They haven't made a big mistake. Yeah. Like, you can't, you look and there's no big mistake. And that is, that's as good as you're going to get to victory, as far as I can tell. But, because there's no, there's no way that you can actually work out some system to deal with this man. But you can't credit you. That's why I don't credit you. I, being a Trump, a Trump whisperer here. I think, yeah, yes, I he and the Mexican president had the, both, the same signal to Trump. And Trump said he spoke to both of them. And as with Syria, for example, it was Trump had an emotional reaction. Right. to pictures. This is not exactly the actions of a, a, a rational or reasoned politician. We may have liked what he did. I thought it was the right decision, but it wasn't based for, the. I would say, the, the most logical reason. He's the only international, certainly the only G7 leader I've ever heard of, who literally makes policy based on what he sees on TV. Yes. Yeah. Like, uh, recently he tweeted, thank you, Lou Dobbs, for talking about how <laughs> awesome I am. And I thought that was the most astounding thing. It's like Obama saying, thank you, New Yorker, for saying how awesome I am. Like, no mature government leader would do that. But because he responds to whatever's on TV, to whoever he's just met, uh, basically... And Trudeau does well on TV. Trudeau does well on TV. And also, by the way, Trudeau was very mature in, in the opening days of the Trump administration. It would have been very tempting to play to yes. his base by saying horrible things about Trump. It would have made everybody in Canada feel good. It might have even made me feel good, but it wouldn't have done 
the, the country any good. But and many, I think Trudeau was, was, was mature to hold off on Many that. people did not like, and I, including myself, what Trudeau said at the beginning was basically say, yeah, old nafty, yeah, real negotiate. He opened the door when he didn't have to to somebody who wrote The Art of the Deal, who is also not the most rational person, uh, but who's looking, who will look at for an advantage immediately. And I think that was a mistake. And I, I think I will say befriending Ivanka mistakes. was actually brilliant. That, that was, was that was good. That was actually that, that was, is that was you know we're saying there's no strategy, but that was actually an excellent piece of strategy because that is the Achilles heel here. This is the only thing that you can reliably say he will respond. And to. it's the irony for a feminist prime minister because if a woman yes, had done absolutely. that, you would have said, oh, he's flirt, she's flirting, she's flirting. How inappropriate! But when he does it, it's okay. Yeah. What Funny. do you think, Tasha, when you see him sitting beside Angela Merkel, sitting beside Ivanka, sitting behind be, the the head of the IMF? He's like. The, the woman, the international woman of the year almost. Is, <laughs> is this a good thing? Well, look, I, I think that most people would say uh, men, nobody will argue that men and women should not be equal. Equality is a good thing. I think Joe Trudeau plays this up a lot in a way that actually as a woman bothers me. When he crowed about having half his cabinet being women, and we found out later, ironically, many of those positions were junior. They were being paid less than the other male cabinet ministers. But this idea that you force the issue as opposed to letting it simply happen bothers me. Um, fine to be a feminist. If you want to be a feminist, that's fine. But don't make it such a thing. Um, just do it. No, make it because then you're defeating the whole purpose. Of, the whole purpose that it should simply be the way it is. Yeah. Instead, he makes taking it, makes proactive hand. steps to a, to advance a political agenda, I don't which like you Lotus. promise, which Shoot is feminine. It, that seems to be the definition of why we elect people. And I just have to say, he has done it. Like people keep talking about hype. There's a strange thing that conservatives do where they call him the selfie prime minister. And I just why keep, is that strange? He takes because more like selfies everyone, than any prime because minister every probably ever person has. younger than me in this country takes selfies all day. Way, you're just, essentially yeah. saying he's the young, technologically advanced person. How advanced is that, Tasha, though? Can I just say that 10 minutes before the show started, we were taking a selfie exactly. to promote the show on Twitter, right. and now here you come on and say, oh my, everybody so takes selfies. That That is a really lame line of attack. No, it's not, it's not a lame line of attack in the sense that there's a line you can draw between the self-promotion of the selfie and governing. And I think he plays too much the PR angle. We've talked about this in no. the early days of his mandate. Okay, let's he's talk cut substance. back a little bit. And let's talk substance, because you know he's given $650 million international reproductive health. Uh, he took a very strong position. He would only name pro-choice candidates to his caucus uh, even before the election started. I actually disagreed with that. I thought it was too doctrinaire. Mm -hmm. I thought it's a matter on which people can disagree. But he was very doctrinaire about it. Uh, so in, in a way, maybe too feminist even for some people in the center. Uh, you can't say that he hasn't put some substance behind his feminist bona fides. Some substance. I mean, you know, the, for progressives, I mean, this whole movement of pe progressives to say he's not progressive enough, or he's just he's just the he's just the same old neoliberal shill of of the of the centrists, like of Tony Blair, etc. I just think that's absurd. I mean, look what he's done. Look at look at the steps he's made on it. You know, uh, uh, on. Um, well, on native issues, or on the environment. What steps has he made on native issues? He's well, he thrown gave. a lot of money at native issues. <laughs> he, no, he has. And what is what is better? This is the thing. A lot of things that have been done under this this administration, people say, "Oh, he's done this. He's done." Well, how are things better on the ground? You talk to a lot he's of done First nothing Nations but leaders. Give money. I mean, no, but he's talked to a lot of First Nations leaders. No, he's committed money. It hasn't necessarily reached the communities. Hasn't necessarily improved lives. I got to wrap up in just a few seconds so on the environment, John. Do you think he's delivered on that? I think he's delivered to a certain extent, but at the end of the day, he had to pick. Am I going to nix all the pipeline mm -hmm. development in Canada? Uh, yes or no? And, you know, he blinked. He said, I'm going to approve certain pipelines. And there's a huge environmental constituency in Canada that says anytime you approve a pipeline, you're making Mother Nature cry. So he, he never would have been pure enough for the environmentalist lobby unless he bankrupted the country. half the right. country. Yeah. So much to talk. I know you're dying to get back in, but Keystone. we're out of time. Keystone. I'm so <laughs> sorry. We'll do this again someday. He's, he'll be in power for a while. Yeah. Up next, how Justin Trudeau is portrayed in cartoons. You portray him often shirtless. Well, he often appears shirtless. I mean, you go with what you've got, Wendy. You have to, right? <laughs> Our feature interview with Terry Mosher, the artist Canadians know as Aislin, on his 50 years drawing political cartoons. That's next on The National.
He's been called Canada's troublemaker, stirring up controversy for a living, all with a pen, paper, and a mischievous mind. Terry Mosher, the artist Canadians know as Aislinn, has been drawing political cartoons for 50 years, documenting our country's history along the way. My conversation with Mosher in a moment, but first, some background. Canada may have the reputation of being boring and beautiful. But our history may be more sex, drugs and rock and roll than many think. Few storytellers have stirred up as much controversy or had as much fun covering our country as cartoonist Terry Mosher, a.k.a. Aislinn. I've got a kind of a nervous looking Paul Martin. <laughs> He lampoons every politician, every moment we've loved or hated over the past 50 years. From the arrival of separatists, to Trudeau mania round one, to our religious fervor over hockey. His drawings have skewered just about everyone. It's so easy to poke fun at these people when they sort of, they pretend to have all the answers. Oh shit, hello, you know. <laughs> These days, everything is fair game, but not so 50 years ago. The Queen was off limits until Aislinn crossed that line. He details it all in his new book, From Trudeau to Trudeau, 50 Years of Cartooning. I met up with Terry Mosher, Aislinn, at the McCord Museum in Montreal, where an exhibit is celebrating his life's work. So 50 years of cartooning, mostly Montreal. Based. How much has the country changed? How much has Quebec changed? You've, so much of this is about Quebec yeah, and Canada? I was, I, got to, I got to cartoon in the heyday of all of those wonderful referendum years and PQ years and that sort of thing. It's quietening down here. There's no question about it. Is that a good thing? Well, maybe not for me so much, but it's a good thing, I think, for uh, people finally realizing that, uh, that Quebec is a a pretty good place and it's run pretty much by Quebecers now and so there's not that old anger that say the Jacques Perezos and the Bernard Landry's had about the English. It's changed and younger people are kind of fed up with this. They'd rather be on the internet. Noticed a few of your cartoons about the, the relationship between the, the French and the English and mm -hmm. one from many years ago was uh, English dogs. Speak oh, French. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the subtle complexities of the political situation here in Quebec. Very subtle. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And the, the graffiti says, speak French, English dogs. Those were the days when that, that sort of thing happened. Another one after the last or referendum, the second referendum, which was the Francophone and the Anglophone sort of speaking to each other, saying, That's, Bonjour Sylvie. That was a cartoon that was called for. If you remember, the second referendum had been very intense, and it was very close, the, the final vote. And I just felt that it ha I had to draw a cartoon, not of the winner or not of the loser, but of two ordinary people, neighbors. Out on their balconies. Balconies. Yeah. And one is taking down her we signs, and the other, the fellow is taking down his no signs, and he's looking up and he says, how have you been, Sylvie? And she's saying, bonjour, Frank. In other words, we've come out of it, and we go back to being ourselves again. Because yeah, I think people outside of Quebec don't understand how one side could try and take the province away, and yet people still somehow manage to get along. Well, we do manage to get along. It's primarily because of hockey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no matter your political persuasion, uh, everybody uh, is a hockey fan here. And that, that kind of, it's one of those things that pulls us together. Like a religion. Yes, yeah, and I started that with a cartoon about indicating that uh, that the new religion in Quebec was uh, was hockey. The other cartoon that you did was very famous. It was uh, René Lévesque saying, "Okay, everyone, take a valiant." Yeah, actually, that was after the PQ was elected in 1976. Uh, I drew this. I walked into the editorial offices at the Gazette. And all the writers had these white faces because the results were coming in. There was clearly going to be a major PQ victory. And how simply it happened was all these jerks could use a Valium. And I went back to my drawing board and drew running out of back point. Okay, everybody take a Valium. And uh, there was an immediate reaction, particularly in the English community, about that. Like, okay, yeah, it's not the end of the world. And I'm ha happy to say yeah, a lot of Anglos left, but 
more of us stayed, and we took our value, and we're better Montrealers for it. You gave Iveca value at some point. I did, I did. It was, it was so funny. I won a national newspaper award one year, and he was, he was a guest in Toronto. And as a joke at the party before the national newspaper awards, I said, Monsieur Levesque, j'ai un cadeau. I have a gift for you. Okay, you know the way it was. Ooh. So I handed him a 10, a 10 milligram value, which is a pretty powerful thing. And Levesque, God bless him, looked at it. He had his scotch, and he took it. <laughs> Everybody kind of, whoa. And his speech died halfway through. He began <laughs> slurring and this, that, and the other. I and I take full credit for that. By the way, uh, at one point, we were pretty good friends. So, so, and he was a good sport about it up until the end. He was, he was, uh, he enjoyed the cartoons. Yeah, I can sort of tell, looking at the cartoons, which people you liked. And I which think, yeah, you. I think that's pr you can't, you can't help. I mean, I, my Stephen Harper cartoons are not remarkable. I don't think. I, I never met. He's the, I think he's the only prime minister I never met. So there was no enthusiasm about that guy, and I don't know if I'd walk around the corner to meet him, quite honestly. Mulroney, you had, oh, you had now, certainly people, enjoyed drawing him. People think I hate Mulroney. It's not true at all. I enjoyed watching him so much. And he was from Montreal, and we all knew him. And the, the Irish bluster and very pleased with himself. Sure they steal your heart away. He was really paranoid about what people wrote about himself. He was sort of a... Uh, he's terribly insecure about that, so it began to really become very easy for me in cartoons to begin to point out oddities. His but then chin. His chin, well, you know, the old expression was, it's not that his chin was so big, he had no neck. <laughs> not true. So uh, early on, one of my favorite cartoons, he was boasting about what the cartoonist did with his chin. He was really pleased with that. So I put it in a brassiere. <laughs> How do you react to that? Uh, I, apparently not very well. Or it was Mila who was, was a little upset about that one. But you can't care about that sort of thing. When you were starting out, you uh, pushed the limits for a while. Yeah. What, what was taboo? Uh, uh, the royal family. There was a huge blob about my royal family cartoons in the 1970s. Well, there was one with the Queen with Prince Philip on... On her knee, yeah. And like nobody had ever drawn a, even a, a critical cartoon of the Queen in the English language media up until that point. Really? Ever? So the, the, in, ever. It was just, it was forbidden. So the Monarchist League went nuts about that one. Well, and I noticed her feet. Yeah, there's sort of su piggish suggestions in her little feet, which you just play around with. <laughs> so you were asking <laughs> for trouble. That we do. <laughs> <laughs> you were asking for it. Uh, in a way, yeah, in a way. And then a few years ago, 2008, the Obamas uh, visited uh, Buckingham Palace. I think it was their first official sort of visit. And Michelle Obama wasn't all that familiar with protocol, right? And she told Michelle Obama, she, she touched the queen, right? <laughs> and her hand was strategically located. <laughs> so I drew this <laughs> with Michelle Obama saying, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Not one letter of complaint. Really? Yeah. So, so things change uh, in terms of public acceptance of things. So, in 1967, Pierre Trudeau was starting his yeah. political career. Now you've got another one. What do you think of the two of them? How do they? How do they compare? I. Uh, all right. The two Trudeaus. It's. Not as if they're, they're Tweedledum and Tweedledee. It's not that at all. But they're both very, very smart and clever people. I don't think people realized how smart and clever Justin Trudeau was. They were all, even these columnists, uh, Andrew Coyne and people were dismissing him as an airhead. And they were wrong, you know? I mean, he really put that, that election is going to go down in the history books. And I remember my favorite cartoon, and I think his favorite cartoon, was just before the election, is Justin peering out saying, we're leading by a hair. <laughs> and that was it, exactly. I mean, and then they just... So he's, uh, he's rapidly, despite all of the, the selfies and stuff, he's rapidly developed a lot more respect amongst the populace, I think, in Canada. And he's his own man. You portray him often shirtless. Well, he often appears shirtless. I mean, you go with what you've got, Wendy. You have to, right? And he... Uh, yeah, actually, uh, my first drawing of Justin Trudeau was him 
uh, driving in his father's car to Ottawa. But then the Sunny Ways thing came along. So I took the cartoon and I added a sun thing. And then he started to go around shirtless. So I took his shirt off. So it's interesting how this cartoon has evolved through different, different phases. So I noticed you, you have an Order of Canada. They had an extra one hanging around. Well, you were denounced in the House of Commons this, what years a great, ago. What a great country, huh? <laughs> yeah, it actually exactly 10 years before I got the Order of Canada. I was denounced in the House of Commons by the Tories for a cartoon I had drawn of Brian Mulroney. Much outrage and, you know, indignancy and that sort of thing. And then 10 years later, I got the Order of Canada. And uh, great country. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. After the break, a new political battle. How the left is using tactics of the right against Donald Trump. That's next on The National.
We Won't Go Away was repeated outside the White House this weekend. It's a simple message, but key to a grassroots strategy sparked by Donald Trump's election. The movement is called Indivisible. Think of it as a Trump resistance meets Tea Party tactic. Kim Brunhuber has more. We may have to be on the public sidewalk because they've been kind of aggressive and pushing us off. Outside the offices of Utah's two senators, about a dozen people are getting ready for Resist Trump Tuesday. It's a weekly protest, and it's a decidedly DIY affair. This guy actually misspelled Trump. I gotta start over. Even here, in one of the most conservative Republican states, a national movement is mobilizing the left based on tactics of the right. Your job is to take care of us. The Indivisible movement started last year as an online guide for resisting President Trump. Since then, it's led to the creation of thousands of affiliated groups across the country. Their tactics? Bombard congressional offices with petitions and phone calls. Demand town halls, then, more often than not, disrupt them. This relentless pressure is aimed not at the president directly, but at their local congressional representatives. These are the people who can make a difference. Tr president Trump is not going to listen to us. If their tactics sound familiar, they should. They're explicitly based on those of the Tea Party, a conservative movement that sprung up in 2009 to pressure congressional Republicans into opposing every plank of Barack Obama's platform. They don't enjoy getting all the phone calls and the emails because it really... This Utah down. group is planning its next phone blitz to swamp its state's okay. congressional okay. offices with complaints about the plan to replace Obamacare. These methods worked for the Tea Party, they say. Why reinvent the wheel? We need to start from the ground up if we're going to make a change instead of just attacking the head without, you know, thinking about the roots. Some of Indivisible's members, like 70-year-old Jill Merritt, are even lifelong Republicans. She says Trump's authoritarian agenda is being enabled by her local representatives. They can't just let this guy do what he pleases. He is too dangerous. She helped put them in office, Merritt says, and when they're up for re-election next year, she can try to help take them out. We'll be looking for that possibility if they don't behave. These Resist Trump Tuesdays were only supposed to last for the president's first 100 days in office, but now that deadline has come and gone, and many have decided to simply carry on. CBO scores are rarely, if ever, right. They were... They were... If they've learned anything from their counterparts on the right, they say it's this. Persistence pays off. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Salt Lake City, Utah. Hope you'll stay with us. Our weekly dig into our CBC archives is up next. One of the highlights of the sports year throughout Western Europe, the International Auto Exhibit. By and large, the designers and manufacturers have worked toward the goal of producing a car that will carry the most people the farthest at the lowest cost. But comfort remains a factor. And as far as gadgetry is concerned, the European car makers are in a neck and neck race with their American counterparts. Transporting cargo is no problem for the XP883. The automobile may be a form of transportation a way of getting from here to there, but it's also much more. It has served Americans as a status symbol, a love object, and an instrument of adolescent machismo. Suddenly we become aware that families that would never dream of purchasing a $100 painting are eager to spend $7,000 for a gleaming, striped and chromed hunk of metal. In their eyes, this suggests beauty. This particular car is all electric, yes, and you remember we came in the front door here, uh, it's very simple. There's a brake and an accelerator and one position for forward and one position for reverse and that's all there is to it. You just seal this up by pulling this down. Right. Let's try it. Oh, there. Do you suppose we'll ever get out again? I don't know. I feel like uh, preserved here like some uh, peaches. Now, we realize the emphasis is on wheels, but we never expected to find this. It's called the Panther 6 because it has six wheels, two on the back, four on the front. The Panther is now handmade just outside Vancouver and uses a huge Cadillac turbo engine. How fast? 200 miles an hour. How much? $200,000. Wow. <laughs> so what will you be driving in 25 years? This prototype was designed to travel at 240 kilometers per hour. 
TV cameras mounted inside the back of the car feed the driver pictures of what's happening behind. And what you do is you program in where you want to go and where you are, and on this screen you'll get a digitized map that shows you the best alternative route to take. This car just might take the place of some airplane flights. The softwood lumber dispute is like a semi-dormant volcano, rumbling every decade or so before going back to sleep. But an eruption could be devastating, risking billions in trade, up to a quarter million jobs in hundreds of communities. So tonight, as the volcano rumbles once again, we have a history of the ongoing battle. Here at NBC, and Mark Hatfield of Oregon, there was... If you think you've been hearing about the softwood lumber dispute for most of your life, you have been. John Chancellor, NBC News. The election race in Oregon is of particular interest to Canadians. One of the hottest issues out there is simply Canadian lumber shipments to the United States. In this case, it's the American lumber industry complaining about Canadian imports. The battle didn't get serious for another 20 years when producers first tried to slap duties on Canadian softwood lumber. American logs cost more than Canadian logs because Americans pay higher stumpage fees. There's just no way that we can compete with that given our system in the United States. People who work in Canada's lumber industry are delighted tonight. They've just won a big victory over the lumber industry in the United States. The $2 billion decision grasped by eager hands. Commerce finds no significant subsidies on Canadian softwood lumber imports. We feel that the Commerce Department erred. Uh, we were dismayed at their decision. This has been heard before and reviewed uh, that I would call trade harassment. But just three years later, the U.S. Commerce Department changed its mind and determined that the lower cutting fees Canadian producers paid amounted to a subsidy of 15%. In the lumber wars, this is round two. And the Canadian owners say they'll win again. Regan has knuckled under to protectionism and uh, he is going to get some key Republicans elected. We've agreed to make our lumber exports less competitive in the United States by applying a 15% export tax. The smiles, what few there were, were forced as near midnight last night negotiators for Canada and the United States signed the agreement on softwood lumber. Forestry Minister Gerald Merrithew says it's the best Canada could do under the circumstances. Will it hurt? Of course it will hurt. Canada's forest industry believes it suffered a devastating blow. I think it was the greatest fraud ever perpetrated on the uh, electorate in both countries. Americans are really trade bullies. In 1991, Canada withdrew from that agreement and once again, Therefore, I conclude that the subsidized imports of softwood lumber from Canada are causing material injury to the domestic industry, and I vote in the affirmative. The United States took another shot today in its lumber war with Canada, but it wasn't the blast some people had expected, and today it cut the duty to 6.51%. It's 
it's the best deal in a, in a bad situation. I say a bad situation because we don't have the protection under NAFTA that we would prefer to have. In 1996, Canada and the U.S. agreed to a five-year deal in which Canada limited its exports of softwood lumber. But when it expired, it wasn't renewed. The United States has thrown the first punch in what promises to be a nasty fight over softwood lumber. If Canada loses, it could cripple the forest industry and hurt one million Canadians who rely on it to make a living. Big boxes are the countervailing duty petitions and the small boxes are the anti-dumping duty petitions. Do not subsidize, stop the dumping, do not surge, or our action would be, will be and should be swift and severe. Punishing penalty. The U.S. makes a hard line on softwood lumber, and Canada is furious. I have to tell you that I honestly find the final determination of 29% obscene. Three sawmills closed, hundreds of employees suddenly out of work. For these workers at the Silver Tree Sawmill in Vancouver, it was their final shift. Well, everybody's upset and they're just, you know, like in the free trade. I don't know what the free trade is all about. The U.S. would collect $5 billion in duty from Canadian producers before another agreement could be reached in 2006. Canada would get back $4 billion and in return, again, limit shipments of lumber to the U.S. and impose export taxes. That would be the last agreement on softwood lumber. The fact is NAFTA, whether it's Mexico or Canada, is a disaster for our country. Included in there is lumber, timber, and energy. So we're going to have to get to the negotiating table with Canada very, very quickly. And on it goes. That's The National for this Sunday night. I'm Wendy Nesley. Thanks for watching.